Hello, everybody. We are live and hanging out for the Juju Show number 14. And I've got with me my dear friend, Mr. Marco. Marco, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Rick? Uh, I am doing well. It is a beautiful day out. I, no offense, but I want to get this over so I can go head outside. <laughs> I need to take my lap, have laptop. We'll travel to, uh, to the backyard, I think, at least. Um, we have a show today of some notes of things. So let's kick off our regular kabang with uh, community news. And there are a few things in the community that I think are worth noting this week. Um, one is there is a thread around moving charm helpers, which is the library of tools used for helping to write charms to GitHub from Launchpad. And it was overwhelmingly plus one by the community. And I talked to uh, James Page, who's been leading this, and he was doing a test run of the migration script from Launchpad to GitHub today, and uh, it will be going there. So I have the URL to the new repo um, in the show notes, and I'm sure as soon as James completes the test run, I mean, the test run seemed to go okay, so I think he's going to actually do the actual move uh, this week, so keep an eye out for it, and if you've been looking or dying to submit that update that pull request to charm helpers look for it in its new home on the juju org slash charm dash helpers github and i know it was kind of fun there's a couple of people who actually called out that they were waiting to do some updates um, on this so go get it let's see next up bd bent everyone's brains and actually taught me a little bit about how juju worked with his little post about how he works with jazz uh, to help provide pre-built models for his developers to work on. And what was really funny is that Jazz out of the box will deploy to the three big public clouds we've got, Google, um, uh, Azure, and AWS. What he was actually doing was a little bit different. He would create a model, and then he would add a remote machine that was prepared. And that remote machine happened to be a virtual box, virtual machine running Ubuntu on a developer's laptop. And by adding that machine, he could then deploy to that machine applications, charms, that uh, were targeted at LexD containers on that machine that was now registered in the model in Jazz. So it's a very roundabout way. What's interesting is that it gave him multi-user access, so he could go into that model, and he could deploy an add unit and set config and such to pre-seed and set up the LexD containers on that developers now virtual box virtual machine running Ubuntu, such that a pre-done development environment was ready to go with charms, but on their laptop. I think this was, I read this and it, it was so cool to read because it reminded me a long, long time ago when we first started getting involved in the Juju project. I remember there was a big debate about, do we focus on cloud providers first or should we go from the bottom up where you just start with a machine and then the provisioning just happens to be this nebulous thing. Someone could have created it. It could have been an Amazon API. And it's so cool to see these, these effectively, these decisions that were made really early on the project leveraged in ways that no one expects. So, I mean, he doesn't bootstrap. It's nothing. It's jazz. You log in. Some developer gave him an IP address to a machine on their laptop, and he just adds that to a model that's being managed by jazz. And now... A bunch of people can collaborate around that VM. And it was such a cool and unique way to kind of enable that really fast developer workflow without having to do the bootstraps and management, the whole LexD area. I thought it was really cool and a great story that I'd love to see a tutorial written around. I know he wrote a blog post, I, I think, as well. To go yep, he's got a blog post in the, in the yeah. <laughs> BD Ever Brief. His uh, post to the mailing list was just a link to the blog post. So I think we all chased it down and went, what is this? And what was, what was great was that there were folks who work with Juju day in and day out. I assumed that when you ran add machine, the controller SSH'd and triggered the connection to the new machine. But it's actually the way around. The client does it. So the controller, you don't have any firewall concerns. Like, you don't have to, I, I, I thought he had to set up Matt and all that. Yeah, he didn't yeah. have to do any of that. Like, BD's one sly little bugger, I got to say. Like, I, he took advantage of stuff I didn't even know you could. So that was kind of fun. Um, what I do think the takeaway I took away from was is that it just goes to show that hybrid clouds more than just I want to run some stuff on bare metal locally and some stuff remotely. Like, there's ways of, mer you know, melding this hybrid cloud bit. Like, you could totally see BD now providing services um, in that model 
say, a database or something, and all the developer little VMs connecting to that database. And that database could be on AWS or something central. Well, all these little machines are on all these little developer laptops everywhere, right? So yeah. talk about a truly hybrid model of, uh, of, of things dev on a laptop right in the same model with production, you know, or stuff running on, you know, on the public cloud. Like the, the possibilities there were kind of like, <laughs> blew my mind. Um, so that's very cool. Definitely check out the thread on the mailing list and, you know, tell us. I'd love to hear how, how are you guys leveraging Juju in just interesting ways. I, you know, it's, it's fun to see what people come up with and how they use the, the tools we build. So um, next up, we have a post. And I, I don't know how to say his name properly, so I'm going to butcher and feel bad. Is it Feng uh, XIA? Uh, he got a, a nice little post. He's been doing a lot of work. And I wanted to kind of highlight trying to get Juju and CentOS playing nice. And the biggest thing is um, he's doing charming work, which involves uh, Python tools. And I think a lot of us have moved to Python 3. And we forget that not everyone can do that. And so he's been doing some really great stuff documenting and highlighting how he's made things work in a Python 2 world on CentOS. And what I love is, is that you know it's a, it's a case of someone's using tools, get work done. They're trying to get through and figure, you know, to, to kind of go through it, and it, it works. It, it's just that, you know, the community is providing, let's call it a wider support structure than than what we have out of the box. But there's nothing that prevents Juju from working on CentOS. There's nothing that prevents these charms and stuff being Python two and three compatible. You know, it's it's good stuff. And I wanted to kind of highlight and say, if you're in that boat, if you're you know interested in Juju, but go, ah, you know, we're on this kind of potentially old infrastructure. That's okay. You know what? It's all still possible, and there are others that are doing the same thing. And uh, the more folks that do it, the lighter the work gets, right? So, um, good work, Fang. So this was Fang Sha uh, from Lenovo. Yeah. Do you know what he's working on, though? I haven't really quick figured out. No, okay. I, I know he's got some interesting problems that he's been working through, but I wasn't yeah. quite sure what he was trying to charm up. Um, I'm not sure. I, I I think his early posts were actually around building and deploying on CentOS. So I think he's. Got some internal workload stuff, um, but you know what? I haven't heard uh, actually what the details are. Maybe it's totally worth reaching out and saying hi and and getting an idea. So back to the last post we talked about, like what cool stuff are you doing with Juju? Fang, what are you cool stuff are you doing with Juju? You're doing a lot of great work on the Python two and uh, and getting it to build over there. We're curious on what the end result is. What are you actually working on getting going? Wow, actually, what I just found. So I, I was reading through that email thread again real briefly. He linked to a page that he wrote about. Python 2 charms. It's a repo that has a bunch of wiki pages. Um, and some of them are actually really quite interesting. Yep. Um, put them in the show note. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if you crawl through this little wiki on this repo, but it starts to map out a lot of architectural stuff, like where these where pieces of Juju intersect with, um, with charms and what the mechanics look like. And it's actually a really interesting. Yeah, he's really been trying to understand how Juju works. Um, uh, understand, uh, he's been putting together some uh, some notes on getting started, and um, I think this wiki stuff is kind of the output of what he's been working on. And and you can see he's been plowing through this for a little bit now in a lot of different areas. And charming is kind of the new the new button. And what I love is that he goes through and then he writes up, like you say, these these wiki pages and things, and shares them on the mailing list. So you know, yeah. join the Juju mailing list, get some of the info, and uh, and see what what fun's going on there. Uh, next up was kind of a question, and I wanted to highlight it. Uh, the question was, was they have a way of logging into the LexD containers on an OpenStack that they had uh, deployed with Juju? And my first reaction when I saw the title was, well, of course, Juju SSH unit number. Well, they had some kind of infrastructure problem, and so they didn't have uh, the controller to manage the SSH for them, in which case the answer was, but of course, the only trick you have to remember is that um, the username on those uh, VMs, the, the the images that come down, is Ubuntu at. So when you SSH, it's not your username. It's SSH Ubuntu at the address of the uh, of the instance it's running. And so the reason I wanted to highlight this is a few things, is that uh, we've been working on, and there's more work to be done, but I know like in the jazz world, we have this where it's very important to have an SSH key for your models, because a lot of things in Juju while it's not SSH driven, um, it can use it, be it um, 
whether you're trying to pull down files or content from a unit, whether it's trying to uh, juju run, actually, I think leverages SSH at times. Um, and so you need to be able to have, you know, having SSH really makes a model more pleasant and easy to work with. And there are a series of commands for folks that don't realize this. There's an add SSH key, listing keys, and you can manage the keys for multiple users and, and all that. And I wanna make sure folks are aware of that because keeping SSH access can oftentimes be important um, the Kubernetes, uh, canonical Kubernetes distribution out of the box has you juju SCP some files down from the workload. I know some charms leverage writing passwords that are generated to a file, and then you basically juju SCP the password file down from the unit. Um, a lot of things will run an action, will generate a file output on the unit, and you'll want to be able to SCP that file back down. And so it's, a uh, you know, SSH is very alive and well in Juju land. And um, if you're going to run production infrastructure, uh, I would definitely make sure that if you have uh, a set of keys for your operators or even your developers and such, that you make sure that those keys are there, that you check that they're there. You know, I think there's a list SSH keys, um, add SSH key and so on. So key management built into Juju and the command lines, you know, leverage it, use it, love it. And it gets you out of cases like this. If your machine with your controller and you know, you had a bad situation go down, you still got SSH access to those things and they keep running and trucking, so. Yeah, um, and finally, uh, a heads up. This is kind of a precursor. Normally I'm covering stuff that's already hit the mailing list and all that, but this is kind of a heads up. It's not there yet. Um, there's been an upgrade to the Juju GUI, which has a lot of good fixes in it. I think there's something like a dozen bugs and a bunch of uh, good feature updates in there, including um, better representation of subordinates, um, there's some uh, better usability on your credential management section uh, of Jazz, which is coming out and will be deployed here shortly. But what I want to remind folks is that when the Juju GUI gets updated, we often kind of say, well, you know, Jazz is updated, there's a, no a new UI. Well, the same UI is kind of leveraged for the GUI that's built into every controller out there. If you ever bootstrap, by default, you can run the Juju GUI command and get that GUI up and log into it and switch between your models and, and all that. And when the GUI is updated, it's very simple to update the GUI that you've got there. You just run juju upgrade juju-GUI. Uh, or maybe it was actually juju upgrade GUI. Sorry. I should have had this better in here. Let's upgrade GUI. Yes. Juju space upgrade dash GUI. And so if you run that, it will actually go and pull down from the canonical services a validated Juju GUI release, update it on your controller, and voila, the next time you log in or refresh that window for your GUI, you've got the latest, greatest stuff. So for those of you that are running controllers, make sure to update your GUI when you get that. Get some new hot goodness. How um What's the what's the kind of expected support for the Juju GUI for like potentially older versions of controllers? So, I believe that we have we have kind of forked off that because the GUI was built into two dot oh. So yep. if you're before, if you're in one twenty five, yeah, yeah, talk about the two dot oh world. Let's go. If Let's you're go. in the two dot oh world, the GUI team does a lot of hard work to make sure it's supported across. So if you're on two dot oh dot x, for some reason you don't want to go, you can still upgrade the GUI. It's all safe. So the support is for for what for right now is that two dot x is all the same Juju GUI. Is there a way to see what version of the GUI I'm running? You know what? So the, I think this is either in this release or a previous release. Um, they have actually added the version number into the help dropdown in the GUI itself, so that we can tell that easier. Um, and so if you're on a new enough GUI, I believe you can go and drop that down. And actually, I've got a GUI open here for a thing I was going to talk about. So let me go and see. I've got a I've got a controller that I've had running for a little while. I don't think I've ever upgraded the GUI on it. Yeah, no, you got to upgrade the GUI. And get the GUI. I wonder if I should just do that right now. Yeah. No harm, no foul. Nothing like live updates on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Marco's brave man. Um, but anyway, so just a reminder. GUIs get updated, and when the team gets the hits the email list with the thread, they'll note how to upgrade it and all that. So it'll be, it's good. It should be in any day now. We'll see that out. I think they're just waiting for it to go live on jujucharms.com before sending the official announcement. So it's there. It's in the release, but it's just not been uh, 
all the way through all of our different production systems yet. So uh, look for that. And that leads us to our main topic, which is actually another item from the mailing list I wanted to highlight. Juju 2.2 RC1 is live. It's out there. RC1 means 2.2 is imminent. The team is locked down 2.2. Um, the feature, the branches are all been created and locked out. Um, test, test, test. Bang on RC1. The team is confident that 2.1 is ready to go uh, into release, which means that any day now they will cut that. So uh, test it so you can find it. I kind of always call it challenge accepted. The team says it's ready. I dare you to find a reason why it's not. Go out and bang on it and file any bugs and things so that we catch it early rather than uh, late. But uh, I wanted to highlight a few things of what's kind of new in 2.2. There's a few um, kind of interesting things to highlight. So let's start off with the provider updates. There were three main provider chunks of work that have gone into 2.2. Um, number one is vSphere support. If you're running um, on VMware, the, the, the VMware provider was in early releases of Juju, but it had some, we'll call them usability warts, uh, things like selecting networks to bootstrap to and such, and they were a bit of a pain point. And the team put a bunch of work into making that much smoother and easier. And I think you even saw Sam do a post running Kubernetes with GPUs and VMware on vSphere recently. So he was using, I believe, a 2.2 beta at the time, kind of showing that off working a lot better. Um, the next one is OpenStack updates. There's been some work to make sure it goes in and handles the Nova to Neutron-based uh, networking APIs smoothly so that as OpenStack deprecates the older Nova APIs that it's ready to go. And there are some other improvements on security group management and reuse, as well as uh, a handful of bugs. Um, they'll be in the release notes when they hit those out. And so keep an eye on if you had any kind of issues there. And then, I wanted to, let's see if I can get my screen share here going. I want to highlight one of them in particular is interesting. So can you see my, my thing here? That was me playing with the GUI. All right. Can you spot the thing that's new and interesting? I'll give you a hint. It's not the green one. Uh, besides Jazz or Oracle? All right. Yeah. So there is an experimental Oracle provider in Juju 2.2. It is not behind a feature flag. Um, but we're still engaged with Oracle on improving the experience of getting started. There's a documentation page, which we'll have linked in the show notes for getting started. Um, but the Oracle has a public cloud now. Um, and it's actually it's pretty fast. Um, I've been impressed with my uh, time to getting instances. Um, the machines are, are decent. I, what's fun is that the, I think the smallest machine is uh, 8 gigs of RAM. Uh, and so, yeah. And so you can see down here the seven, uh, 768, uh, 7.6 gigs or whatever it is. So the machines are, are decent size. The performance is going really well. Um, you can see here I've got a our Kubernetes deploy and a, a CI deploy. So here I've got um, GitLab server with Jenkins and a cell termination proxy playing with uh, our kind of some of our dev stack bits on it. And I can switch over to my kind of Production K8, even though it's not production. This is Rick tinkering. Um, but here you can see our canonical Kubernetes. Oh, no. What happened? My hook failed. How dare it? I'll have to go look at that. So um, here you can see I've been kind of playing with and, and pushing and, and beating on the Oracle provider and uh, making sure it's all working smoothly. And so far, other than my, my hook error that I've got to chase down, everything seems to be working really fine. So if you're an Oracle customer or you're interested on in, uh, checking out some of their, their new cloud offering bits, definitely check it out. And it's one of those, you know, Juju, it's everywhere you want to be. I feel like we need an awesome tagline for that. Um, we won't mention All right. It. We're not going to mention it. No, we're not no, going to mention it. <laughs> no, no, no. There's no mention that Rick hit the wrong button on his no buttons. There was no buttons at all. I don't know what you're talking 14th show. No, as he was trying to screen share completely inappropriately. Um, so back to where I was heading, Juju 2.2. You had something really cool you about to show us, Rick. I, I did. I, I do. You know what? Kapow. 
Um, <laughs> here we have the GUI running on that, that Oracle uh, model that I was just showing off. Um, but this is what I wanted to show off. Um, and let me see if I can. So the big work in Juju 2.2, the, the stuff the team and, and, and I'm most proud of is that performance, scalability, all that has been just ratcheted up. Uh, the team has put a ton of work into optimizing memory usage. Um, I showed a while ago, and I'll link to it, a, a blog post on how to track your controllers and, and monitor them with a Grafana setup just like this. This is actually using the same exact dashboard I had in the blog post from before um, to track, uh, to optimize the logging. Um, compressed logs are now in there by default. The logs are configurable and capable so that you can manage your disk space usage. Um, CPU load's been heavily optimized, like just across the board, everywhere you can look, the teams worked hard on making things more performant. And as you can imagine, we're running Jazz, which is hosted Juju for users. Um, and so you hosted Jazz users, get ready, because 2.2, you'll see it probably before everybody else does as we update um, the infrastructure on jujucharms.com as soon as that goes out. That's part of that service. But we're obviously heavily invested in making this stuff scale up better. And I don't know if you can see this very well or not, but um, this was from a test from yesterday that I was watching the team go through and perform. And they're they're tracking 1,400 machines in over 140 models, basically 10, 10 machines, 10 units per model at the thousands level. And here you can see, I mean, these are on kind of, you know, they're, they're on beefier machines. So here you can see the controller where I was setting up my Prometheus Grafana to, to monitor it. And if you look at the machine here, you know, these are uh, uh, C4 large, extra larges oh, that we're oh, running these on. Machines, yeah. These are big machines, right? No doubt. Um, but, you know, 30 gigs of RAM isn't exactly insane. Like my desktop's got 32. If I'm going to run my production stuff and HA at scale, I don't know that 32 gigs of RAM is anything insane. And you can see that, you know, running at 1,400 models, what I love is, is you can see I've got this ramp up here as I ramp up the number of models and machines. And notice that things like memory and such don't, they don't ramp up with it, right? Like we've we've got pretty, you know, pretty good scale going across tracking it at, at these levels. What is that um, unit of measurement of bill? The billion? So I think it's billion bytes. Um, if you look, it's actually like running at around 12 gigs of RAM is around where this starts to peak out at. Okay, I was like, I know, <laughs> I know. This is this is called Rick needs a, needs to spend more time with Grafana lessons to to set a you know to divide it down into something more reasonable. But what I can tell you is, out of the um, the reporting here, it's basically eight, ten, twelve gigs of RAM. This is a HA uh, three node uh, controller set up and running, and um, and what's what's fun is is we ramp up to around twelve models a second, um, or a minute. Sorry, twelve models a minute ramping up here from a single machine making requests. So it's basically adding 120 units per minute, cranking up, just deploy, 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 and then bang on it. And the teams, this is the kind of work the team's doing to help make sure that Juju 2.2 is scalable, tested, is just beat on and something that we can rely on. So here you can see, you know, load, Obviously, you know, varying around as things are going through. Now, I will say. But still, that's fine. I mean, that's 16 cores, so a load of 12 is still decent, actually. You still have unused cores. You don't have a weight, yeah. basically, a weight queue. Yeah. So um, I just kind of wanted to kind of show and highlight. And then here, here this is just kind of fun, right? <laughs> Run Juju models. And, and so you can see I was playing in the controller one down here at the bottom. But basically, this is just scripted, try to destroy the controller. And we could not do it. It's holding up really awesome. So I'm very proud of the work going on there. Um, you know, those, those graphs were not always as flat as they are now. And it's really impressive to see the hard work the team's put into that. I mean, I can especially attest to that. I've got a 2.0. Uh, embarrassingly, a Toyota Beta 18 controller running somewhere right now, and I checked the I checked my dashboard in my cloud provider, and I was like, "Why is this at 100% CPU? It's not doing anything." And um, so it's been I, I'm really impressed with from even 2.0 to 2.1, and now looking at this stuff for 2.2, I'm really pumped to redeploy these on new controllers and start leveraging all those new features as well as those performance improvements. Yeah. 
Um, one other one I wanted to highlight. So there's obviously a bunch of little things in here, a little usability, a ton of bug fixes. Um, but this one's this is a bug I filed, so I care a lot about this one. And so I'm very happy to see this. And let's see, I think I need this. I'm gonna risk screen sharing again for the sake that I don't kill the <laughs> screen. Why would anyone do that? Um, so I'm gonna switch to see. Um, controllers wanna switch over to my mass testing where I was at because I was doing some, something. Ah, did you switch mass testing? And on here, I'm uh, playing with some, uh, some big data stuff or whatnot. Some of this has got Spark and things in it. Uh, but what I was doing was, so I can run an action. I'm going to run Spark Pi, right? I'm going to trigger and say, you know what, Spark, go generate some Pi for me. Have fun with it. And it's going to queue an action. Now, actions are asynchronous, and you can have many of them, and they, and they they take different time to run. You know, if you run a backup and then you want to run, give me some other information, it will take a while for that backup file to generate and get done and all this. I totally understand there's these little UUIDs that are the reference to the action. But I was so annoyed because um, – I, I don't want to copy and paste UUIDs just to see if it's done or whatnot. And so now there's a new flag on show action status, which is a name flag. So now I can actually just enter the name of the action I ran and say, you know what, give me the status for any of these actions that are named this. And so if you're doing an action over and over or whatnot, or you've triggered a bunch of things and you just want to know, is that one, how's it doing, is it done yet or whatnot, having this kind of filtering and usability into actions is a little bit nicer. I think that... Uh, there's some other improvements around the kind of action usability that's in 2.2. So check it out. If you're having a heavy user of actions, which if you're doing, you know, full Juju operations, I don't see how you can't be. Um, it's some good, some good updates in there for you. So uh, with that, I've heard various, I mean, the, the team's looking to go 2.2 and, and uh, go GA with it with, within the next week. So before our next Juju show, I fully expect it to be released. Uh, so keep an eye out. Um, get your model upgrades uh, work, you know, tested and working. I will say that uh, RC, you can upgrade in place you know, from an RC to, to GA. That's fine and all supported. Um, I highly recommend folks check out the documentation for model migrations, that idea where you have it running and you bring up a new controller and you can migrate the models from one controller to the other. Remember, this is just the state database, just the Juju info migrates from one controller to another. Um, model by model so you can do it at scheduled times for that workload and that's like our rock solid way of doing those upgrades if anything goes wrong it falls out nicely and keeps everything running back where it was um, and so model migrations is has been even more polished in 2.2 and so that's really the best way if you can manage to have that hardware on hand to do that managed migration the best way to upgrade and actually, now that I say that out loud, I should really do a blog post on that. With 2.2 coming, it would be a good time to talk about model migrations and, and uh, production upgrades. Um, that's the last I got, man. Cool. Got, Marco. It's exciting stuff. It is. It is. There's some good stuff coming. So with that, I leave everyone on part two, and I'll stitch it together, and hopefully we'll have one seamless part of the Juju Show, episode 14. Thanks for coming by, everybody. <laughs>